Hi, and welcome to this uh, seminar on the Moving Master Shot and uh, the Ronin 4D from DJI. Uh, my name is Rubidium Wu. I am a filmmaker, um, both as a writer, director, cinematographer, uh, occasional uh, gimbal operator. And I'm um, super interested to, there we go, super interested uh, in film technologies. I have my own uh, YouTube channel called Crimson Engine, uh, where I talk about a lot of uh, the stuff that I do uh, and new technologies that are that are shaping filmmaking. But today we're going to talk about uh, the moving master shot, which is a, I wouldn't say advanced, but a intermediate um, film technique of connecting your individual shots together with either a moving camera or a moving subject or a combination of both. And uh, we'll talk all about how, how, why you would want to do that, um, the best way to do it, uh, how it, it makes your uh, locking, which is, you know, the combination of where your camera is, what your lens sees, and how your subject move in uh, relation to the camera. Why do you want to do that? And how technology like the uh, Ronin 4D allow you to do that very, very easily because it takes all the separate elements that you need to do this process um, and puts them all in one package that is uh, factory uh connected and and they're all designed and made and pre-connected so rather than you know spending all the time setting up some kind of steady cam rather than all the time setting up some uh, some gimbal rigging unrigging getting all working connected it all comes from the factory connected with everything that you would want out of the box you pick it up you turn it on and you start your shot making <clears throat> so we'll take a look at that a little bit later but uh first i want to talk about what uh what coverage is what a one is and what a moving master is, which sits in between coverage on one end and a one on the other. So uh, you guys can ans ask questions um, in the individual uh, uh, things that you're on. We're streaming on several different platforms. Uh, so there's someone at BNH that's going to type those into the, uh, the, the Q&A here um, and the chat. So I'll stop at different times and try and answer as best I can uh, questions that people have as we go. So let's let's jump in here. I'm going to share my screen. Let's do it all. Right. Last time this happened, it wasn't. Uh, it was frozen. Looks like it's working this time. So this is a program called Set a Light. No, not this one. Um, well, there used to be a little tab that said about satellite, but uh, Set dot A dot Light, and it is primarily a photography tool for light modeling. So in this window, you see your scene with your camera, with your lights up here, and then in this window, you get your uh, in this window, you get whatever your camera is seeing. So up here, you can say, oh, it's a 50 mil lens or it's an 80 mil lens. Up here, you can say your frames per second, your shutter speed, your T setting. It's T1.4, right? That becomes brighter. And then as you move things around here, you will get the result rendered out for you here. So... This is, and down here you can have in the timeline predetermined shots. So this is a pretty standard, very common scene, two people talking. Let's say they're in a um, psychologist's office. One woman is on a couch, uh, on, a, on a seat. One woman's on a couch. This is, you know, maybe even come back further here. This is usually the first shot you get, the establishing shot. It shows the audience. There are two people. This is, this is how they're uh, in relation to one another. This is how close they're sitting in one another. This is the room that they're in. And uh, this is often called an establishing shot or a wide shot. Um, then you would get your in. So you would shoot this. If you're shooting what's called coverage, you would shoot this shot first. Then you might go in for a single 
on this woman. You would play the whole scene out here. Then you would go for a single on this woman. Then you might do a close up for this woman. Then you might do a close up for this woman. Then you might do a wide on this side. And then you might do a wide on the other side. However, you do that, you bring the camera around here on her, pull back here, tilt it a little bit. So we would have, and then I'll just save that as a snap. Move it over here. So we have our studios love this sort of uh, method of uh, shooting. And it was very common in early studio days because cameras were too big to move in any real way. They had to be on train tracks, essentially. They were these huge, monstrous things. So the studios love this because if they don't like the way that the editor or the director cuts the scene, they can always fire both of those people and they have seven different takes of the scene from seven different, well, at least seven different takes. Because right, it, if, you, if you're the director and you're shooting this and you don't like the actor's performance, you don't like thing, you'll, the, anything about the shot, you might go in and do another take of, of this scene. So this, shot, this particular setup, this shot might take, you might do three or four takes on that. You might do three or four takes on this. You might do three or four takes on this. Maybe you just do one take of her because she doesn't have much dialogue. Then you do four or five takes on this and two or one takes on this. You're at 20 plus takes. That is a ton of footage. The actors at the end are going to feel like they went through a um, roller coaster because they're going to, if it's an emotional scene, they're going to have to perform that 20 plus times. Now, the studios, like I said, love it because if they, they have so many different variations, and they can, essentially, if they need to fire the director or they're not happy with his work or her work, they can go in and hire a new editor, a new director, recut this however they want. There are millions and millions of variations. It, uh, so, you know, actors don't like it very much. The studios really like it. They're the ones paying the bill. So this is how a lot of scenes get shot. Uh, I'm going to keep checking back on my... How do I do that? Keep checking back on my Q&A here. Seems to be good. Okay, good. But directors don't particularly like it because it gets boring to shoot like this. It takes a long time. It burns out actors. What people started doing was adding multiple cameras. So you would shoot both, maybe the wide in one, in one setup, but then when you did this woman's close up and the other woman's close up, you would bring in two cameras. That means at least three more people because each camera has an operator, a camera assistant, and a focus puller. And it also means that you can't get the lights as close as you would want them because they'll be in the shot of the other camera. If you have two cameras like this, right? This shot is going to, this light's going to drop with this camera shot. So you have to back them off a little. So the light can't be as close. It can't be as, as cinematic, as, an as nice the aesthetic as you would like it to be. The other disadvantage is you only have, you can only focus on one thing at once. So if you're in the director's booth, watching your feed or you're even worse, if you're running between the two cameras, there might be a false note or a bad take, or someone might flood their line or like a fly might lay on someone's cheek, but because you're watching both monitors or three monitors or four monitors, because you're trying to shoot it all at once for, for efficiency sake, uh, you'll miss it. And then you'll be in the edit being like, oh, we only got two takes of this and both of them are bad. So how do we going to have to, rather than choose the best take for the story, we're now going to have to cut around the problems of the scene in order to just get the story to, to just get through it. So not ideal. Um, the opposite end of the spectrum is the one -er. So that means you start in your wide here. Seems to be doing well. Are you doing okay? Yes. Um, we start in our wide. Then maybe we let me see here, push in to this woman when she asks a question. Then when the dialogue changes to the other woman, we slowly tilt our camera around to her. And then as she starts to talk, we push in again. This is all one take. No one stopped talking. No one stopped recording. 
focus is going to have trouble because I've got it on manual focus. So there. Oh. So then she may have some dialogue and then we pull around here behind her. We have to clear those lights, obviously. Let's put this light up higher. And let's get her to the stand. We'll tend, pretend it's strapped to the ceiling. And then now we've, we've gone around behind the couch and now we're on this woman. So uh, you can see that it's a much more artful way to shoot a scene. It's a much more elegant way to shoot a scene. Um, it requires much more discipline on the uh, side of the director, the actors, and the cinematographer because it's like a well-oiled machine that has to fit together. Like all the cogs have to know, go exactly where they are. And um, right, if you're just shooting this shot here, if you're just shooting... Uh, Where we have it before, it's moved in on me. If you're just shooting this shot here, the the focus doesn't change, the lighting doesn't change, the uh, position of the camera doesn't change. You're just the whole time. You're just on these two women. So the, the focus pull is doing nothing. The camera, so he can't mess it up. The camera operator is doing next to nothing. He can't mess it up. But when you go for that one eye, when you go for that flow through the scene, any one, even the even a background extra that steps into shot a second too late or too early can cause you to mess up and start again. And it usually takes six or seven takes at least to get a one-er right. And a complicated one is it can take all day. It can be take, take 50. Um, so it's not easier. It's not like a simple, uh, the the coverage version with multiple cameras is, is much, um, much simpler. But uh, the one is much more elegant. And that's why, uh, especially when gimbals came along and steady cam came along, um, more many, uh, far more many people, far more people went for that type of shot. The problem, uh, with the one is that, you know, here, this comp, this is a, a dialogue scene. You can, fill up the space of the one with dialogue. And actually, before I move on from the one, let me show you an example. This is from Robert Zemeckis's What Lies Beneath. We start on Michelle Pfeiffer. It's a close-up. We pull out to the nurse. We pull back further um, to Harrison Ford shaking hands with her. We pull out further to a five shot. So he's in bed on one side of the um, shot. And then Michelle Pfeiffer is in the middle and there's police or something out here. Then we start pushing in again. Uh, we get Michelle Pfeiffer in the background with this woman and we get Harrison Ford signing a paper. We almost get a uh, insert shot, like a cutaway shot of the, of the paper, but we don't. Camera comes around even more to uh, now it's an over the shoulder of Harrison Ford and Michelle Pfeiffer. And in the background, you see these two people doing something as well. So this is very artful. This, uh, what lies beneath was Robert Zemeckis's, who did, who friend Roger Rabbit and the Goonies and a bunch of classic movies. It was his tribute to Hitchcock. Hitchcock loved oneers in scenes because he felt it increased the tension. It increased the uh, uh, attachment of the audience to the screen because they figured they couldn't look away. And he loved making all the pieces make sense. It's like assembling this really complex jigsaw puzzle. And Zemeckis was a huge fan of Hitchcock, inspired by Hitchcock. He wanted to make a movie uh, that had uh, was made up of like 12 or 15 winners. And that's what he did. Uh, I don't think it's on Netflix. It's actually quite hard to find what lies beneath, but it's Harrison, Shaw, Harrison Ford and Michelle Pfeiffer at the height of their you know, 90s popularity. It's a great film. Um, Hitchcock actually made an entire movie in one take. And that's even before uh, film cameras could shoot longer than about 20 minutes. And what he did was he hid the cuts of the takes in a pan across someone's back or pushing into something. Um, and Rope is the name of the film. It's an it's a absolute you know classic of Hitchcock. And it's one that a lot of film students watch in film school. And everyone should watch because it's a great movie. Um, it starts with the murder. And then <laughs> it was a pretty terrible idea. The people who commit the murder 
have the body in the middle in the middle of the room in in a table or something in a box and then they invite all their friends including a famous detective to to the party and you see everyone's conversations as as the detective solves the murder or tries to um so that's that's the one and you might start thinking here's another version of the one from call of duty uh and you'll see we start with this is this is a nice example of how you're not just moving the camera you're moving the elements in the foreground and bringing people into the field of view um, so that you can create as interesting an image as possible so we start low we have these trucks that come in then we pick up this guy's feet we follow him in as we crane up and then one of the trucks that came in um, these people start jumping off and we end in and over the shoulder of the dialogue between these two guys. Then the camera orbits around, picks up this guy with the skull mask. We see his face, we pan down, and then we uh, track with him as he walks away and then walks out of frame. This would be a very complicated shot <clears throat> to do in real life, um, but in the virtual world, super easy, right? Like they probably did motion capture or whatever they wanted, um, maybe just animated and got the voice style, uh, probably motion capture actually. And then in, in the virtual, in Maya or whatever they animated this in, they were free to fly the camera wherever they wanted. Uh, you know, move the camera in any wild place. There's no physical limits in, in animated space. So they were, they were free to put it wherever they wanted. And that's what they come up with, this really interesting one. It also connects to, um, very closely to the video game aesthetic of call of duty which this is from where you're you don't cut you're you know you're a fpv um fpv that's the wrong expression fps first person shooter you're following the whole time in the eyes and the mind of the person holding the weapon so uh your the cutscenes with the dialogue are a similar idea but because they don't want to just they want to show both the person who's talking and the person who's being spoken to so they do this very artful thing where they come up and around and you could do worse than watching video game cutscenes because the budgets of these things are in the tens of millions of dollars um millions of dollars per minute and they have left nothing to chance and they are really really good in the way that they create their frames and they artfully link everything together um, and they light everything and they motivate the lighting. And then, you know, this comes in and everything that it does. I realize I'm not sharing my screen. Hold on. So yeah, just, just the way, and this is from Modern Warfare 2, I believe. Every, everything is working in perfect concert. Now, you won't be able to do this as beautifully in your live action, but you will have real people rather than pixels talking. And so we'll probably be able to get something more impactful anyway. Um, so these are these are both oneers. What is the disadvantage of the oneer? Why not just shoot everything as a oneer? Come back to here. Why not just use as a one? Great, we're doing one is a better than coverage. They, um, they, they. You don't have to cut. It's, it's. You save a huge money, a uh, huge amount of money on your on your editing. You're just um, pulling the camera, you know, wherever you want it, and it works really great. So, so why not just do one is all the time? The problem with a one is that you often end up. Uh, you're you're totally locked into whatever you shot on the day. You've got nothing to cut away to, no way to shorten it, um, no way to, if you have a really great performance by the first actor in the first part of the shot, then you pivot around and then, you know, in the second part of that shot, that actor's performance is terrible. Or again, they have like a fly on their face or about to sneeze, the, the extra in the background, uh, you know, his costume falls off, whatever it is. With a one there is no real post-production. You're stuck with it. So what would be perfect is to have the, the integration and the, um, the, the beautiful, artful shot making of the one and the time advantages of the one where you one and done, plus a little bit of the control of the coverage method where you're getting 
five versions of this, five versions of this, five versions of this, and then picking the best version and then choosing to the to the frame where to cut them. This is where we get into the moving master. Let me see if I can find my Oh, my camera gets together. My hard drive is booting up. All right. What I've done here is something similar to Robert Zemeckis's, where we start and show outside. We pull back and we find the woman by the window. Then we pull back further have her walk backwards to the woman in the chair. But now we've cut to a different take, a different one. We get the woman in the chair's face. We get her agreeing. We cut back to our original moving master, uh, original one, cut back to the reaction shot. So we cutting back and forth. Then she walks away and we pivot around to get a one shot of the girl in the chair. Then we pull back, you know, to the woman on the phone. And then she walks out of shot. And then we come back to the woman in the chair. So what a moving master is, if you want to think about a moving master, it's essentially shooting the shooting the scene as a wanna, but then instead of having to hold in the wanna while nothing is happening, while you're just transitioning from one side to another, or having to wildly circle from one person to the other as they exchange dialogue, what you're doing is covering off 80% of your shots, as many as you easily can in your one and then having cutaways to the other person, the dialogue, to something on the wall, to whatever it is, within the one that gives you flexibility to use the first half of one take of the one and the second half of the second take of the one or any combination thereof, and also cut in um, stuff that is going to make it tighter. So it's a nice balance with both of the strengths of both techniques, coverage and wonders, um, that give you the maximum amount of freedom uh, on set to kind of, you know, not have to slavishly get everything that you're going to get with the camera to get this one, to just get the ones that really present themselves and then cut away when it makes more sense to. And uh I think it's a really, really strong way of of putting your scenes together and um, making it all making it all work. So, what would this look like? Yeah. So, rather than, I hope you guys can see this. So, rather than um, starting here, cutting to here cutting to here, cutting to here, we'll start in our, we'll start in our wanna, sorry, we'll start in our wide shot. I'm mixing the terms up now. We'll start in our wide shot, we'll establish, we may as well start as wide as we can. We'll go back right against the wall with a pretty wide um, thing. We'll push in here, we'll move camera right and pan left to pick up the woman on the seats with the dark hairs dialogue. Then once she's done, you know, some intro, done the the bulk of her dialogue, we'll start moving camera right and panning. We can do this. We can lock it in. We'll start moving right to here, and then we'll push in a little bit. We'll get her main dialogue, and then we'll come around behind the couch for a two shot, and then that will be the end of our shot, not the end of our scene. This this first shot will now form um, will now form our establishing our first couple lines from the woman in with the dark hair, and then the last couple of lines from the woman with the with the blonde hair. What we all then might do is start from a this wide here, and then just push in on this woman as we come behind the other woman to give depth and give an over the shoulder sort of thing. So we might shoot the scene all on that coverage. Then 
So we're now we're only doing three setups. Then what we might do is like a Godfather shot, you know, the opening of Godfather, where there's a nice long dialogue from just her. We'll have to carry the camera up. You can tell that even on a 50 mil lens, we're getting distortion on her face, right? We come in here and it's kind of like buggy. So let's do this on a 100 mil, right? Oh yeah, look, that's very Godfatherish. And then we'll get her whole scene just pulling back all the way. And then as we get to here, we might pull this side or we might just go all the way back to here. And then um, if we had a zoom, which you can do on the Ronin 4D, we might zoom from 35 to 100 as we as we go in. So you're not sure we do that. So start here and then zoom out as we pull back. That's what they did on Godfather. They had a com computer controlled zoom as it starts on his face and then pulls all the way back to establish the Godfather. So now we have we've done essentially um three winners, but we've covered the scene. We've only done hopefully three takes. Maybe okay, if they're winners, um, we're gonna do three takes on each one. So we've done nine takes, but we've got lots of different options, and we should also definitely get a cutaway of the clock on the wall or something like that over here so that if our jigsaw puzzle doesn't fit together just right we have one more little piece that we can throw in there to complete the whole picture um and you're 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 thinking like a wanna but you're not locking yourself into and limiting yourself to the entire scene in one shot which can be uh like i said back you or paint you into a corner sometimes And I would definitely, I mean, the big, the big disadvantage of satellite is that you can't record animation. It's mainly for, uh, you can render out individual things, but there are other animation, you know, special previous things that you could render this animation out. And my advice would be, if you're planning this, um, know what your location is going to look like and block your shot. Now, <clears throat> that can be uh, its own problem. And I want to really flag that with you guys because what has definitely uh, led a lot of directors uh, and cinematographers to the wrong place and got them, you know, really jammed up is that they'll previs a one or a movie master on their computer and then get to set, and the set will be slightly different. The the sun will be coming from the wrong direction. The actor won't want to sit there. They'll have a big long problem about why their why their character wouldn't do that, um, and and uh, you'll end up having to redo things on the day. That's okay, right? Like you shouldn't feel as though you should abandon it. Like you've got this perfect one here. I've planned it meticulously. I've spent weeks, you know, getting dialing in every tiny minutia, and it's going to be it's going to be so involved and so complex and so wonderful. Get to set, and you're like, well, it's not going to work. What do we do? Shoot coverage? No. <laughs> the longer you spend in, the longer you spend in this environment, in the you know, and this you should have modeled this after your location. Hopefully, you've seen it, and you're not just you know making things up. Um, the longer you spend in this space, the more you explore it with the camera, the lenses, and the lights, the more likely you are to be able to come up with a good solution on the day, right? Like if if you know you're you're, you should feel like you're, you know, moving things around in your own lounge room and you know where everything looks and where the, where the sun comes at any given time of day, uh, where everything, wherever, how everything is going to gel together. Um, I love, you know, playing around in satellite or Maya or, or, or SketchUp or whatever it is, because it means that you're familiarizing yourself and you're able to think creatively before the pressures of set are there, before the art director is asking you, you know, what color the wall should be, before people are like, what do you want for lunch? Suppose someone's saying, well, second AC hasn't turned up, who do you want? It? Like all of those things detract from your potential creativity. And if possible, you should be protected from all of those. But like I was when I wrote, directed, and produced my feature, you're just going to be people are going to be asking you needing for things from you the whole time and when you're here alone um in the in the in the setup it's so much easier 
to think creatively, to put all those distractions aside, only think about where cameras go. And if you're super smart and I, uh, and you're very well prepared, you should have worked out all the different permeations. Like, oh, what if the actors, what if the actors want to sit together on the same place? Uh, you know, what if they want to be on the same couch at the same time? Um, that's fine. Uh, if you actually pre-visualized that, worked out where the um, the cameras could go, the lights could go, all of this stuff could happen. And if you're starting to get really smart, you could say, well, maybe she starts here and then somewhere during the move of the camera, somewhere during the scene, she gets up and then sits next to the other woman. Now, that's probably not going to happen in a psychiatrist's office or psychologist's office unless she's coming over to, you know, offer a tissue or something, get a glass of water. But it can make for a much more dynamic scene where now you're not just lighting and uh, photographing still objects, essentially people sitting on the spot. You're now, just like that Call of Duty thing, moving the camera as the subject is moving as well it's much more three-dimensional it's much it feels much more alive it feels you're putting the audience within the scene um, in a much much more interesting way and what i like to do is just get as much as you can in that movie master at least at least don't start with don't just start with your wide shot where have we had it Don't start with just that and shoot the whole thing five times from the wide. You're only ever going to use it usually at the start or at the end, or if someone does something big, right? If she's kind of come over here and sit there, then you'll have to pan, and that's great, right? You're now moving the oops, that's this seat. You're now moving the the moving the camera at least the head the the camera on the tripod. But um, ideally, what I like to do. And if I don't do anything else, I like to turn my um, turn my establishing shot into at least one of the singles, into at least you know this woman's this woman's single or that woman's single. It can be an OTS single, meaning over the shoulder. So that why you you'd want to shoot it like this is that um, your with this woman in the foreground, you see, still see her hand gestures. You see you're getting closer to her eye line because. Right, you can get right behind her here. So the the woman in orange, the blonde woman, will be looking almost straight into camera, which is good for connection. Um, so it's great to to drift here, but um, if nothing else, use your your establishing shot for at least one other shot. Then, if you have this, let me show you the single here. Then if you have this single, and I'm going to turn down the, whatever light is doing on her face because it's very bright. You have this, then at least push this in to this close-up, like at least combine those two. Right? You don't have to zoom. You can just physically push the, put the camera on some kind of movement, have it on a Ronin, have it on a, um, a dolly and push in. Then because you're going to want to intercut, do it with this shot as well. Have this one push in. Now you have your pushed in master. You're pushed in uh, from your you know close up to your ex extreme close up. Um, and now the the coverage is much more dynamic. You 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 just get you're just trying to get two shots with every shot. So you're doubling up. So you halve the number of um, takes you're going to have to do. Halve the number of coverage you're going to have to do. You haven't really compromised your lighting at all because anything that works in in this you know, shot is definitely going to work in this shot. Um, you don't need the the lights, you know, right, right. I have this one almost touching me, but this would work on the white as well. And so you now cut, you're cutting movement with movement. Movement always cuts better with other movement than it cuts with, um, you know, still. So still cuts to still, movement cuts to movement. When you cut from a moving shot to a still shot, it always looks a little bit it always takes the audience a little second to to um, you calibrate, and then you you've lost them for a little bit. So movement cuts great with movement. You might have noticed this tendency now for to orbit in your in your singles, uh, meaning go around the person like that. And this is a cool shot where you you're orbiting around from this person 
you might start on her and you orbit around to her single. Well, she's got the light in her face. A little more tricky because you have to light this person. Um, and as you saw, the camera went through the wall. So <laughs> it's, not gonna, it's always not going to be perfect. But um, start, in her start in her one shot and orbit around to her um, over the shoulder of her. It's all of these ways of just, just connecting two shots. Just start by connecting two of the shots on your shot list together and seeing if there's any big compromises with connecting them by movement or connecting them by uh, the woman sitting in, right? So if I go on to this one, here's her shot. So you might start with her and then we pull back into what could be a two shot if this woman then comes to sit next to her. Miss our lighting up a little bit. So we've gone from a single shot to a two shot. Um, we've gone from our single to our two shot. Um, and then if we wanted to, we could keep pulling back into an establishing shot. We should shoot the establishing shot last. Um, that's an interesting way of doing it, but that's how they do it, do it in a lot of great films, including the Godfather, right? Like they start on uh, the, the Undertaker's face and they pull back to establish as he does his story uh, of his uh, daughter being attacked. We start to see more of the room and then finally we reveal the Godfather. Um, Conrad Hall didn't try and then whip around to show Marlon Brando. He cut to show Marlon Brando. He did it in a separate setup. So I think that's it's a really smart, artful way of, of, of connecting your shots. Let me see what else we have here. Give me one second. I'll bring up. We'll see what we can bring up on the, the BTS. Oh, that's a nice thing. Um, so let's go in here again, share screen. If you're not going to uh, previs, and a lot of directors don't, they don't like to, they don't want to, a great way to plan your shot with either the actors or stand-ins, right? You can have, uh, you know, producer or the continuity person sit in or just friends sit in while the actors are in makeup as you plan your shot what i found works really well is an iphone um, on a gimbal and because it doesn't have any of the focus demands it doesn't have any of the exposure demands it's not going to give you as good a shot but it is really great to block something out and get a sense of what lens you should be on what your exposure is going to be where where your frame is going to be where you have to get the lights out of the shot, right? You see in this in this shot we did as we pull back on her, but we pulled too wide. And we we got these the the light, the four by four here. So really what I could do is um zoom in and pan right for this last segment. So we get Maya and we get Megan. And we we, we you want to shoot wider than you need to so you can crop in. But before we did any of this, we did it all on, on an iPhone with a, I forget the name of it, the Ronin, um, the DJI, it's not the Osmo, I have it somewhere. Uh, it's this little phone gimbal. So that lets you connect everything up. And that's a great way, if you're not planning on pre-visualizing in a computer, to pre-visualize uh, on set before you start the camera rolling, um, the main camera that is. When I worked with Steadicam, I would do this while the Steadicam was being built. Now, Steadicam is um, is great. Uh, you know, it's still what a lot of Hollywood uses. Uh, you're going to be paying a thousand dollars and upwards for the Steadicam operator, and you know, five or six hundred dollars possibly for the rental of the Steadicam. It takes about an hour to rig. Uh, so once you've given them your camera, they're going to wait it and you know pull the batteries on and and test it. So while they're doing that, I found it was really great to do 
uh, a, a, an iPhone run through of the shot that I wanted. Now uh, I actually do uh, with a with a Ronin forty. Uh, you can block it with the camera itself, and that'll give you a good idea of practice and focus of of the camera. You can also do it just with your iPhone because you're not that worried about the movement because it's not going to be your final shot. You can just walk it through uh, with the iPhone and, and see where your frame is, see where your line is. Also give the actors the sense of, you know, okay, your line now. Okay, when I get to hear your line now, because you'll still be, they still won't be able to deliver their lines rapid fire or, or, or um, potentially where they would want to naturally because they're going to have to wait you know, in this example, we come back, she gives her line, she gives her line. Then I need to get, before she starts talking, I need to get around a little bit and oh yeah, there's not a light. And then Megan can't start her line until I get back here enough so I can see her face. So there's always a few little delays and it can, if you're shooting it on your phone first, it can give you a sense of what those delays are going to be and the actors as well and help them get their rehearsals up to, up to speed. So here you see me shoot it with the 40. I'll go full screen here. Or I come down, pick up on Maya. We then, you know, we see we had this trouble here where she was too high in relation to, let me stop sharing. So we had this problem where one girl was in a chair, the other girl was standing. There was too much of a height difference to get both of them in frame. So what we could have done was put that chair up on Apple boxes or something, get a higher stool. Didn't really make much sense. So we just had the other uh, Megan lean lean in as though the person is sick and they didn't want to raise their voice. You can always, if you're smart, you're thinking on your feet, which is the job of a cinematographer director. Um, you can always find an excuse in the blocking in the way the, the actors are in relation to one another to, to come up with something like that, where she leans in close or to like, you know, fix her clothes or check her hair. And then that's why she's close enough to deliver the line in a place where the camera can see. Then we come up for her line. Then I'm walking backwards. That's not ideal to be walking backwards unspotted into nothing. I mean, by spotting, I mean, you know, like what you would when you're lifting weights where you have someone uh, basically walking forwards with their hand on your back, making sure that you're not going to trip over anything or walk into anything, especially a light on set. So it can be great if you're doing this backwards motion sort of thing um, to have a, uh, a spotter, um, usually a camera assistant, usually the person that'd be pulling focus since you're pulling focus for yourself, mainly on the 4D. Um, but this is how the, this is how the scene evolved. Uh, I don't know if we have any questions at this point. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, so I was going to uh, open it to questions if anyone's interested, if anyone has kind of, you know, getting this but not quite getting it all the way or would like to um, answer, uh, ask any uh, ideas of how to integrate this into the work. I'd, I'd love to hear of it. Um, then I'll go into a couple more sort of practical tips on how to use the 4D for this sort of moving master. Let's see, Q&A, loving it. So as you can tell, this is the 4D, to back up a little bit so you can see it. It is the, the sensor, the sensor on its own gimbal uh, with the uh, the Z axis suspension. Then you have your big, nice touch screen here. And then you have the body of the camera with the image transmission and the battery where you can hold it close to your body. If I undo, that's okay. If I power it on. Take a second to start up. Mm 
and I'll engage the 4D. Should be able to lift up. Oh, all, the, all the axes of the gimbals are locked. Hold on. It's been a while since I used this. That's one. That's two. Okay, why is around his? So now we're we're gimbling, and you get this. this if you haven't used it before, this little lidar unit up here is going to show you where everything is um, through kind of like a ghosty image. Um, so you're able to use the thumb here. It'll it'll actually what it'll be doing is I don't know if you can see that it'll be moving automatically. You can see the the lidar sending out its light rays for focus. It'll be moving automatically on on auto, and then you can push it out of auto whenever you want. You can like override the autofocus. Um, let's see, lock that for now. This one, um, it is quite a large unit. We're going to 10D. Let's have a look. Great. Um, it is quite a solid unit. And DJI have released a version of this where you can essentially wear all the heavy stuff in a backpack or a chest plate and only have the nice little... Uh, 6K or 8K sensor with the gimbal in your hand. So it's a lot lighter and it much it lends itself much more to longer shots, um, either, you know, like a two or three or four minute thing. What I found as a good uh, rule of thumb is that you should, you should uh, take off meaning not shoot for at least twice as long as you're shooting. So if you have, you know, a two minute shot that you're trying to get together, like it's a, you know, it's a three minute scene and you're going to do the first, uh, the establishing shot and push in on one of the characters, you're going to do that for two minutes. Take at least four minutes for yourself and your body and your mind before you go and go for another take. What can be really tough um, with gimbal operation um, is true of the Ronin 40 as well, which is that unlike a steady cam, it's not holding the weight for you. You're not, it's not redistributing the weight to your chest or your hips or your shoulders. You're taking it all in your hands. And especially if you're working with a director and they're like, great, let's go again, reset. You, you have to um, prepare them for the fact that this is a very physical practice of operating a camera and you need, you can do it time and time again, but you do need enough time to, uh rest between takes otherwise the quality of your work is going to degrade as the actors and everyone else is getting better and better with practice that's not what you want you want to be able to uh improve with time as the day goes on as the shoot goes on and to do that you definitely need breaks in between each take so let the director know beforehand and then um you know give yourself that long like two minutes while everyone resets and then get to another two minutes. You don't go back as soon as you first feel ready because you're not fully recovered yet from the, from the concentration and the physical demands of the, of the operation. What you really want to do is give yourself more time. So you'll, so you'll have uh, a much better experience and, and, and get better. You don't learn much when you're right at the edge of your, just struggling to hold the shot in the middle of the thing, because if you flub a take because your arms get too tired or you start shaking, even though, yes, the 40 will take that, a lot of that shake out, um, you're not going to deliver your best work. You always deliver your best work when you're not trying 100%, but trying like 70 or 80%. And you're, you're at that limit. Uh, you're at that in that comfort, outside the comfort zone, but not pushed to your extreme limits yet. Um, it is a very, very cool device. Um, you, uh, the 4D, it, the, if you have it, you will find more and more ways to use it. 
that's what I really like about it. Um, it's great for um, it's great for shooting live because you can, you know, obviously with the right support, which we'll talk about in a second, you can shoot for hours. Um, it's great for BTS. I've been using it a ton for when I'm shooting with my other cinema cameras. I use the Ronin 4D for BTS because I know I can get a ton of great footage, especially uh, it is very difficult, um, you know, to on a two dimensional plane, like a screen project a three dimensional environment. And when people say, Oh, how'd you shoot this? Where were your lights? Were your actors? What was your blocking? All the stuff we're talking about today is much better if the person holding the BTS camera is moving around and through your space because that gives you much more dimension. It gets the, lets the viewer know everything, all the elements that are coming together, how they're related. Um, there are a couple of, let's see if I have them. There are a couple of um, devices that you can help you uh, with your with the the weight of the Ronin, if you don't the forty, if you don't have that uh, the version where you can take its sort of take its head off. One of them is the Easy Rig sort of thing, right? Where it's it's suspended on an, on a on a line in this sort of backpack arrangement. It's bigger. So you put it on, it redistributes the weight to your, to your shoulders. Then the, the camera is suspended on it and it takes the weight of the device as you're free to operate. Oh, I'll, I'll, Mark, I heard your thing. Uh, I'll type the answer. It's called set a light. Light or light? I think it says set a light. Um, so that's one version. It's called the Easy Rig. You can get uh, knockoffs of it, or different people make different versions of it. Another one is called the let's see this guy, where it's a much more involved thing. It is basically this is called the Gimbal Bird, where it's a similar system, but rather than one over the shoulder. Uh, sorry, one over the head cable, it's two arms that come up and hold it. Uh, it can be either for gimbals uh, or um, the 4D where it holds it and takes almost all of the weight. This is the sort of device I would use if I was shooting, you know, a live event or a multi-hour, you know, uh, shoot where I really wanted to be able to have the, the device hold almost all of the weight. You can also do what Steadicam operators do, which is have an assistant. And as soon as the shot calls cut, the assistant takes the camera away from them, takes the weight from them, lets them stretch, sit down. You know, sometimes they even have a, the assistant carries around a, an Apple box, like, like this one. And whenever the, the director calls cut, they put down the Apple box, the operator sits down, um, they pick the camera away from them. And so they let them uh, have rest in between takes. You, you know, it seems very bougie to be like, I need an assistant. I need to sit down every time I stop shooting. But directors know uh, that that the reality is that the more rested you're, you as the operator are, uh, the better your, your results are going to be. So that pretty much brings us um, to the end of our event. We've covered coverage. I want to how the movie master is a combination of the the best of both worlds of those two things um how uh you know you can either go for an extreme sort of movie master where you get the whole thing as a wonder and just get a couple of cutaways or you can do two or three moving masters of different size and shape and then intercut them uh however you like how you just design those um on set or you can design them in a a, a program like satellite or um i'm trying to think of another one or Maya or cinema 4d or sketchup they're a blender there are a ton of you know free or very expensive i think Maya's like 1600 dollars a month or something um solutions to this but the you'll you'll never go wrong um another thing you can do 
that I d- didn't talk about was you can go to set with your cell phone or with a DSLR, meaning go to the location before with just the director, the cinematographer and the, and the production manager and, you know, use the director and the production manager as your stand-ins and, and film it on your, on your cell phone or DSLR and then get everyone to buy into what that coverage is because you then you take it home, you cut it up and see that the coverage is going to intercut. Uh, sorry, the, the movie masters are going to intercut and get what we want to get before you commit to it on the day. Um, we've talked about uh, how the 4D functions, different support ideas, pre-visualization, um, just how you have to have a different awareness and how if you, you're going to do this sort of shot making, um, you know, don't wait till it's a huge project, make or break, career killer, career maker before you do it. Do it with your friends. Uh, do it with your collaborators, you know, experiment with how you get the information across. Um, I think you'll be really surprised to um, how you, how it, how functional it is. And the, the, the Ronin 40, let me have a look. It, you know, they're, exp- they're not cheap, um, but they're certainly for the, for the image quality, they're around the same price as, you know, uh, a C70 from Canon or a um, uh, FS6, whatever it is from Sony, um, you're getting all that extra functionality without having the problems of rigging and de-rigging and customization um, all in its all in its things. Here we go. Lens Pro to go. Four-day rental um, for Lens Pro to go is 400 bucks so or $100 a day um, for, the, uh, for the Ronin 4D. Um, which is not a huge amount of money um, in the scheme of things. Let's see, I got Q&A here. Uh, Mark also likes to know, what would be a good camera cell phone to start with, Nikon, Canon, Sony? I'm not aware that Nikon, Canon, or Sony, maybe Sony makes a cell phone, um, make cell phones. You can use your iPhone. Uh, there are a couple of apps. Artemis is one. Uh, let me have a look. I've used one called, what's it called? Magic Arrival. I'll show you. Sorry, Magic Ari Viewer. Um, and what that does is basically gives you a, put next to my face, let me focus. It gives you the ability to change your lens length and see a preview of what it will, what the the lens will be on your phone, and then you're able to record as you move through. Um, I'll also find the name of that. Okay, iPhone gimbal. It is the Osmo Osmo SE. They're a hundred dollars. Um, Osmo Mobile Six is hundred and fifty dollars. So that cell phone um, gimbal that I use for previs, really cheap as well. So that's 159. Thank you very much for being part of this. Thank you, DJI, for uh, sponsoring this series and uh, you know making making all this great stuff. Um, I really think gimbals have changed the game. So uh, appreciate everyone coming in. Uh, we're almost we're almost uh, at two o'clock. Uh, I'm hoping to teach more of these. Um, tune in and uh, look out for for the more that we have. Um, thanks again to B and H for organizing this and hosting this. I uh, appreciate uh, appreciate you guys involving me in your in your education. I don't know whether I should just keep talking <laughs> until the, the screen goes up, uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off now. Uh, thanks thanks a lot, guys. I'll, I'll see you on the next one.